today I'm going to do a Reiki and Crystal healing treatment on Charzad and Susan to help balance their energy and give them some stress relief. Crystal healing is an alternative medicine practice that has been around since antiquity, with records from Mesopotamia and ancient China. References as far back as 1700 BC state it was used in magic, healing, and protection. For some reason, people who use crystals love talking about how they originated from the ancients and how they knew so many secrets about science and medicine. I find that pretty funny considering the ancients also believed the earth was at the center of the universe and bloodletting cured diseases. The concept of modern crystal healing is that all things in the universe have a specific energetic frequency. Based on mood or environment, a human being's frequency can be made into positive or negative frequencies. In contrast, a crystal's frequency does not change and is very stable. Much like a tuning fork, they're used to recalibrate our frequency to make it more stable and positive. Oh, and by the way, these aren't things that I believe, these are things that crystal healers believe. Um, between the aura and the chakra system, which are different components of our energy field, we can have these imbalances that can create difficulties in aspects of our life, like mm. mentally, emotionally, physically, or spiritually. During a healing session, crystals are placed on the patient's body to align with their chakra points. Where the crystal is placed can also depend on a specific ailment, like on the head due to a migraine or stomach for indigestion. So what scientific justification do crystal healers have? Well, let's ask crystal healing expert, Teal Swan. But there is more to this physical dimension in reality than meets the eye. Our current definition of what is alive is incredibly inaccurate. The current definition of what makes something alive is something that exhibits movement, respiration, sensitivity, growth, reproduction, excretion, and nutrition. Yeah, no, this isn't the correct list of what defines something as living. The correct list is cellular organization, reproduction, metabolism, homeostasis, heredity, response to stimuli, growth, and adaptation. But I'm guessing you're going to disqualify this list because it doesn't represent all living things. We need to start defining alive in terms of consciousness. Nailed it. What constitutes something being alive is in fact the ability to be aware, to perceive, and to think. The ability to perceive and think are not what qualifies something as living. A jellyfish can perceive light and sound, but can't think. Nonetheless, it's defined as living because it executes these traits. To say perception and thought constitute living is paradoxic as it's both general and incredibly narrow. Viruses and prions are an example of conscious beings which are very much alive, but which do not exhibit all of the traditional characteristics that we think constitute life. Okay, how are viruses and prions able to perceive and think? With what proof do you have, if any? I'll tell you what they really are though. Prions are just clusters of proteins and viruses are nucleic acids held together in a lipid or protein compartment. No brain or neural network, nothing. They only spread infectiously because of their mode of transmission through food or aerosol particles, not because they're alive. Also, what does any of this have to do with crystals? Minerals, especially crystals, are also alive. Finally, here we go. That is, they are conscious, they are aware, they think and they perceive. If you're going to make the bold assertion that crystals are living, you've got to provide some kind of evidence. Even a sliver is fine. We have discovered life forms deep within the ocean that are alive, conscious, and reproductive whose bodies are made up of 100% silicon. Their bodies do not contain any carbon whatsoever. Wow, that's really interesting. No carbon in their bodies at all. It'd be fascinating to see how its DNA would have no carbon in it, despite carbon literally being an essential element to form deoxyribose. You know, as in deoxyribose nucleic acid or DNA. 
What I'm going to guess is this woman is lying or completely ignorant of biology. The organisms she's talking about are called diatoms and have carbon distributed throughout its entire body like every other carbon-based life form on Earth. For example, with DNA, the DNA helix only exists with a carbon-based ribose molecule in it. It's true that silicon is similar to carbon as carbon has four valent electrons and so does silicon. However, the properties of the silicon atom are much different from carbon. For example, silicon chemistry requires higher temperatures than carbon to form bonds and therefore is not conducive to generate life. However, there is silicon in these organisms, but it's hydrated silicon dioxide and is only a component of the diatom cell wall. That's a far cry from 100% silicon. So where is this going in relation to crystals? Well, she's making the connection that there are organisms made of 100% silicon. If there are living 100% silicon organisms, which there aren't, then that lends a possibility and subsequent proof that crystals, like quartz, which is made of silicon, is living, which it's not. We have discovered life forms deep within the ocean that are alive, conscious, and reproductive whose bodies are made up of 100% silicon. Silicon is the primary element of quartz crystal. Crystals are living beings. Uh-huh. That's analogous to saying that since humans are carbon-based life forms and capable of perception and thought, that means my pencil, made of graphite, is also capable of perception and thought. And the rest of the video is just her making increasingly ridiculous claims, such as these. So when you introduce fluorite into the equation, the vibration of that ailment, being the arthritis or cancer, must change to match the vibration of the fluorite. When you have a headache, you might take something like aspirin. That's because there is a component in willow bark, which is what makes up aspirin, which helps the human pain system. The frequency of willow bark is a very high and slow frequency. It's not a compatible vibration with the vibration of something like a headache. So the frequency of willow bark and the frequency of something like a headache are incompatible. So uh, let's move on. Okay, let's apply real science to this. Firstly, the presence of energy fields. Crystal practitioners say both humans and crystals produce an energy field, or chi, due to a vibrational frequency. Okay, sure, I'll humor you, but let's agree on one thing. If there is an energy field that can be manipulated by a crystal, then logic would follow that this energy field could also be observed or measured. Sure, you can't see or measure gravity with the naked eye. However, Einstein mathematically proved its existence with his theory of general relativity with the distortion of space-time. In contrast, there is no mathematical proof or explanation of energy fields produced by crystals, because they don't exist. The inability to produce tangible proof of said energy fields thrusts the defense into an ad hoc fallacy, much like Carl Sagan's Dragon in the Garage thought experiment. In this famous thought experiment, Sagan tells an observer that he has a dragon in his garage. The observer appears inside and says, there's no dragon. Sagan then says that the dragon is invisible. Then the observer says, what if I use these infrared goggles to see its heat signal? Sagan replies, the dragon is cold-blooded and the goggles won't work. And so on. The crystal advocate will make the same endless ad hoc claims to explain the absence of something not actually being there. For example, Many people who are limited by the physical dimension, which have you believe that you are personifying an inanimate object when you are treating a rock like it's a pet or like a person? All right, so the energy fields can't be explained. Okay, maybe the science isn't there yet. But surely crystals themselves have energy. This is obvious because they're used in lighters, radios, and computer chips. Without crystals, computers wouldn't exist. So crystals also demonstrate the piezoelectric effect. And what this is, is basically when a crystal is compressed or distorted, it allows for the transformation of mechanical energy, which is that pressure, to be conducted into electromagnetic energy. This is why quartz is used in computers. That's why it's in your phones. That's why it's in radios. And this is the connection that's made. It's because it allows this, this energy transformation. You can use crystals to bring you back into alignment, to raise your frequency and help prevent any sort of disease or ailment. The piezoelectric effect produces electricity and electricity is energy. Congratulations on making that connection. But this doesn't validate the idea that crystals have inherent spiritual or magical energy. That's not how the effect works. When a mechanical force is applied to a quartz crystal, the crystal generates a brief electric current. This is because the silicon and oxygen molecular structure is compressed. The average positive charge from the silicon atoms move upward and the average negative charge of the oxygen atoms move downward. 
this displacement of charges produces a brief electric charge. This doesn't mean crystals are energetic, rather it demonstrates that the atomic structure of crystals can be altered to produce a charge. Also, the piezoelectric effect is not observed in all crystals. For the effect to occur, the crystal has to meet two criteria. It has to have polarity and be non-central symmetric. Polarity just means the atoms making up the crystal don't equally share the electrons in their bond. For example, oxygen unequally shares electrons with hydrogen. Non-central symmetric means the lattice structure cannot have symmetry. In a quartz crystal, the atom directly across from any silicon atom is oxygen, so it's not symmetric. But diamonds do have symmetry as they're solely made of carbon and therefore don't exhibit the piezoelectric effect. The final ace in the hole a crystal advocate will use to prove their point is Marcel Vogel. Marcel Vogel, a world-renowned scientist who holds over 200 patents, including one for the floppy disk, discovered that crystals are able to receive and send both human thoughts and emotions. Marcel Vogel was a prolific IBM scientist who held over 32 patents in magnetic and liquid crystal technology. Later in his career, he combined science and occultism that led him to claim some very outlandish theories about crystals. For example, he believed quartz contained a metaphysical power that allowed them to store thoughts. On one occasion, while observing them under a microscope, the crystals formed into whatever Vogel was thinking. The problem with Marcel Vogel is many of his claims could not be reproduced and had no legitimate scientific basis. Just because a well-known scientist makes a claim, it doesn't mean that the claim is true because they're really famous. Believing what Marcel Vogel said about crystals is like saying we should study Newton's work in alchemy because he discovered calculus and the laws of gravity, when in reality, we all know alchemy is complete bullshit. This brings us to the real reason why crystals work, the placebo effect. The placebo effect is a beneficial effect on the body produced by a placebo drug or treatment, which cannot be explained by the properties of the placebo itself. Instead, the effect arises from the patient's own state of mind. Say you have really bad back pain. Your doctor gives you a mint and tells you it's a really strong pain reliever. You take the mint believing it will stop your back pain. Afterwards, you sue your doctor for malpractice, but also, if you end up having less back pain, that reduction in pain cannot be attributed to the mint because it was just a mint. Instead, your mind and perception caused you to recognize less pain. But how does this really work? Dr. Ted Kapchuk, the director of placebo studies at Harvard Medical School, says that brain scans show when patients take a placebo drug, believing it will improve their condition, it triggers specific regions in the brain that release endorphins and natural painkillers. The same chemical reactions happen when you experience very positive situations, like receiving your first kiss or getting a high test score. For example, when a patient, when a person is treated with the rituals, symbols, placebos, the pills, whether they have content or not. Um, when you're in pain, the brain releases endogenous opioids, cannabinoids, or, and or prostaglandins. There's a veritable pharmacy in each and every one of us. The placebo effect is heightened even more when a patient is in a particular environment that reinforces the positive effect, like talking with a healthcare professional or going to a clinic. When a person feels sick and down, and you go into an environment that's designed to help you. You go into an environment where everyone around in, in that environment wants to help you and provide you relief. And you're in an environment that these people know every kind of technology that society has to make you feel better. The brain's processing of sensations, self-awareness, and symptom changes, sometimes in a very positive way. People who receive the whole nine yards, that is, go to a clinic, speak with a healthcare professional, and receive the treatment, exhibit the strongest effects from the placebo. In a study by the British Medical Journal, patients with IBS were treated with acupuncture and were told the treatment would reduce their effects. 262 participants were split into three groups. Group 1 was given no treatment, Group 2 was given only acupuncture, and Group 3 was given acupuncture and spoke with a healthcare professional. As a result, 44% of Group 2 noticed an adequate reduction in their symptoms. Group 3, on the other hand, showed a 62% reduction in their symptoms. The increase in relief in Group 3 was associated with the patient-practitioner relationship. Now, don't get your hopes up. The placebo effect can't actually cure a condition like lowering cholesterol or reducing the size of a cancerous tumor. However, it can modify your perception of symptoms associated with a condition like bodily pain or anxiety. This is where crystal healing comes in. 
Some people who go to a crystal healer say they feel positivity or reduction in symptoms after their session, such as these women who were skeptical and received a full treatment. There is no scientific evidence that crystals and gemstones are able to treat ailments based off their color and chemical make. Yeah. We both live with chronic pain. And I have a neuropathic pain called trigeminal neuralgia. And I have endometriosis among many other pelvic floor dysfunction. I've never tried crystal healing, have you? I have not. Hi, my name is Juliana Davis. Wait, oh no. I'm a Reiki master, crystal healer, sound healer, spiritual teacher, psychic medium, and the owner of Orlux. They mentioned how the treatment reduced their anxiety and stomach problems. Maybe it's wishful thinking, but it felt like she was pulling some of my pain out of my stomach. The pain where it normally is, is not as severe right now. So I definitely think there's some sort of connection between the crystals and the relaxation that it brought. Both went to a clinic, were taken care of by a professional who assured them that the treatment works, and then received the treatment. These conditions are very similar to Group 3 in the IBS study from the British Medical Journal, who had the highest reduction in symptoms. So how do we know that the placebo effect is at work during crystal healing? British psychologist Christopher French addressed this very question in 2001 at the University of London. French wanted to see whether the placebo effect was significant in people who believed in crystal healing. 80 participants were told to meditate for 5 minutes while they were holding a crystal. The participants were either given real or fake quartz crystals, but were told they were all given real crystals. Prior to meditation, half the participants were asked if they noticed any effects that the crystals had on them, such as a warm or tingling sensation in their hand or positive emotion. Afterwards, all the participants answered a questionnaire asking if they noticed any effects from the crystals. Results showed that participants given fake crystals described the same effects as those who held real crystals. Listed effects were reports of a warm sensation in the hand holding the crystal and a general increase of positive mood. Those who were questioned before meditation reported even stronger effects than those who were not questioned. Additionally, those who said they believed that crystals had special powers were twice as likely to report effects from the crystals than those who were skeptical. It's no coincidence that the placebo effect had a much stronger impact on those who were previously questioned and held beliefs in crystal healing. It's no surprise because this correlation is something scientists call expectancy. Expectancy is the patient's anticipation of a future response after the administration of a placebo drug or treatment. Expectancy is one of the direct mechanisms that causes the placebo effect. An example would be a patient who has administered pain from a shock and is then told they will be given a topical cream that will reduce the pain sensation. The cream is actually a placebo. However, the verbal cues from the administrator in the clinic setting causes the patient to have a preconceived expectation that the cream will reduce pain. Expectancy is what occurred during the Christopher French experiment and it's what causes people to receive effects from crystal healing and other forms of pseudoscience. Now you might be thinking, well, if going to a crystal healer causes the release of endorphins and makes the patient feel better, why should you care? Sure, to each their own. However, if the placebo effect works by endorphin release, you could just work out, meditate, or get extra sleep to get the same effect, instead of paying. It uses gemstones all over your body to aid in the facial process. It goes up to 395. But if crystal healing is a mostly harmless treatment, why should we care if people choose it at all? Addicted to Ignorance is going to talk about some of the harms of crystal healing. Take it away. So at this point you might be thinking that it doesn't really matter whether people believe in crystal healing or not. After all, for most people, crystal healing might mean nothing more than a collection of pebbles on the mantelpiece. But for some people, this belief goes much further. I came across this case report of a man found dead in his home with a number of healing crystals implanted under his skin by amateur surgery. You'd have to guess it was at least painful, although apparently the crystals were not the cause of his demise. Now, cases like this might be rare, but the phenomena of yoni eggs is all over YouTube and Facebook, and quite a number of women are putting themselves at risk of infection, and I don't think you need me to tell you where. But apart from these cases of misadventure, there are two main ways that crystal healing harms its believers. The first is financial. Sure, a chip of quartz isn't going to set you back much, but there are far more expensive crystals on the market, and there are books and courses that will set you back hundreds or even thousands of dollars. And if this is money that people are intending to spend on their health and well-being, it's been sadly diverted into something useless. And this brings me to my second point. 
Crystal healing distracts from real treatments. Yes, there are lots of videos on YouTube and groups on Facebook dedicated to using crystals for treating things like migraines, back pain, infertility, and even cancer. And look, when it comes to something as serious as cancer, any amount of distraction, delay, and confusion can have real-world consequences. There have been a number of scientific studies which have found an association between the use of alternative medicines in general with shorter lifespans for cancer patients. And the likely reason for this association is distraction from effective treatments like surgery and missed appointments with real doctors. And the danger of selling ornaments as medical devices has been picked up several times by regulators around the world. Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop was recently fined $145,000 for selling a series of women's health products whose advertised medical claims were not supported by competent and reliable science. The most egregious offenders seem to be Goop's Yoni eggs, which the site claimed could balance hormones, regulate menstrual cycles, and increase bladder control. In New Zealand, this crystal shop in Napier was singled out by their Advertising Standards Authority for its unsubstantiated claims that its products provided therapeutic benefits. Crystal Sanctuary said their products had a range of health benefits, including protecting against nightmares and helping people overcome addiction. The claims were found to be unsubstantiated by evidence, and Crystal Sanctuary was forced to remove the adverts. And in my native UK, the local Advertising Standards Authority has also rejected crystal therapy due to a lack of evidence. In 2013, the ASA considered claims on a website which implied that crystals could be used to help heal a number of health conditions, including Alzheimer's, Asperger's, asthma, depression, and heart disease. The advertiser accepted that they did not hold clinical evidence to support the claims being made, and it was subsequently ruled that the advert was misleading. The current advice to those wishing to advertise healing crystals in the UK is something of a stark warning. Because the Advertising Standards Authority and Code of Advertising Practice have yet to see any evidence to support claims that crystal therapy has a healing effect, marketers are advised that they should hold rigorous clinical substantiation before making any efficacy claims about the therapy. Despite all this, it seems that crystal healing has infiltrated conventional cancer care in the UK. This 2010 survey found that crystal healing was used in some hospices. And I find this sad. I'm quite confident that we can offer more to hospice patients than magic rocks. But it's not just the people who use crystals that this industry harms. Crystals sold in shops in the US and elsewhere are often mined in lower-income countries. In 2019, The Guardian published an investigation into the working conditions of crystal miners in Madagascar, finding that child labor was rampant, people were being crushed and suffocated in collapsing mines, and the unregulated industry threatened the rainforest. And all of this chaos might be easier to justify if what was being pulled out of the ground at great human and environmental expense actually had medicinal properties. Now, at this point in the video, you might be getting the impression that we don't like crystals, but that's not true. There's nothing wrong with appreciating the beauty of nature, and all is not lost for those excited by the potential use of crystals and geological material more broadly for medical and scientific purposes. Sure, you could buy a lump of obsidian from some cheap website and hope it confers some kind of psychic ability on you, but I think it's much more interesting to know that obsidian blades are still used in surgery today because of their exceptional cutting abilities. Similarly, diamond knives are often used for eye surgery, and research into the use of nanodiamonds for cancer treatment is ongoing. Crystals are routinely grown in molecular biology labs the world over in an effort to understand the structure of biological molecules. In fact, the structure of DNA was only revealed after DNA crystals were grown in the lab. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. Crystals are exciting and they're very useful, but they're just not magical. On the stupid scale, I'm rating crystal healing at a 10 out of 10, and on the harmful scale, a 5 out of 10. If you enjoy my series, Questions for Pseudoscience, then check out Addicted to Ignorance. His entire channel is all about debunking pseudoscience. He does an especially great job at calling out fake cancer cures and cancer survivors who promote alternative medicine. If you want to stay up to date on all kinds of pseudoscience and quackery nonsense, I suggest you check out his channel. You'll be happy you did.